And last week, we specifically looked at the first temptation that Christ received. We're going to continue to look at his wilderness experience here this morning as he was tempted by the devil. I trust thus far that you have been impressed, like I have, with who the Lord Jesus Christ is and even how he came to be the perfect man and endure all these things for your sake and mine. You know, we live in a world today that has many opinions about Christ. Many want to paint a picture of him that they want to be comfortable with. Um, a Jesus that in many cases thinks just like they do. And, uh, you know, they want Jesus to support their cause. I, I came across an article this week where uh, an author who was writing against the death penalty um, said that Jesus would not support the death penalty today. And uh, he said these words, I have a feeling that the executed first century teacher would not support a death penalty or want his followers to. Many forget that Jesus once served as a one-man jury on a death penalty case. In a famous New Testament story, an adulterous woman was dragged to Jesus' feet and he forgave her. And that is true. But in drawing that conclusion that he drew, he did not consider going to other Old Testament passages, such as, or New Testament passages, such as Romans 13. And oftentimes we make the mistake of, of recognizing that Jesus on a personal level came to be every man's savior and that every sin is forgivable. That's why he came. He's a friend of sinners. He personally forgave that woman uh, in that situation. Uh, but they don't differentiate between the role of government. Uh, that's different. Government, the point of view from government, according to Romans 13, is that uh, they have the authority to use capital punishment if the crime warrants it as such. And so, but there's many different ideas about who Jesus Christ is. And so how does one discern the truth? I mean, and this is why understanding who Jesus Christ is in context is, is very, very critical. The Word of God tells us that there's many false Christs that we need to be aware of. And you know, when it comes to the most important issue facing mankind, namely their internal destiny, understanding who Christ is is paramount. Jesus himself warned of believing in false Christ. He said in, in uh, Matthew 24, he, for there shall be arise false Christs and false prophets and shall great signs and wonders in it so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. The, the Apostle John wrote these words in 1 John 2.18. He says, Children, it is the last hour, and just have you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. And from this we know it is the last hour. The word Antichrist means against Christ or in the stead of Christ. Uh, the, the, the Greek prefix there can mean either or. And the Antichrist denies the true Christ and proclaims a substitute of some kind. And it's important for you to understand who Christ is, what he said, and discern between the false Christ. Thankfully, God has not left us in the dark or even confused the answer who Jesus Christ is. And this is, of course, this, again, especially important in the area of salvation. God has plainly shown his desire to save all mankind and showed us in the word what that plan involved and involved Jesus Christ. The Lord desires that all men be saved. And so sometimes people are taught different things and confusing ideas when it comes to Christ. The Bible is clear, though. You can know you have eternal life, and it's through Christ. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other. The apostle Peter said this in reference to Jesus Christ. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that's why Jesus himself said in John 14.6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's only through Christ because Christ is the only Savior. And this is why Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a saying trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus, that's who we're talking about, came into the world to notice save sinners. And Paul says, I am the worst of them all. That's how he viewed himself. He recognized the closer he got to Christ, how sinful he truly was. When I always think of this verse, I remember talking with a young man, I said, do you see yourself as a sinner? And he said, no. And I said, well, you got trouble then because Jesus Christ only came to save sinners. And if you don't see you're a sinner, then you can't be saved. And that's why he came. We need a savior. What do I need to be saved from? Well, you need to recognize that God is holy. He lives in a perfectly holy place. He wants all mankind to live with him in perfect harmony forever. But he's righteous and he has to be true to his character. 
And so when you think of being saved, you're actually, as a sinner, God seeks to save you from the righteous judgment that you and I deserve. In Romans 1.32, we read, Knowing the righteous judgment of God, God is a perfect judge, and he has to judge sin. He can't pretend to be someone he's not. Those who practice such things are deserving of death. That includes all of us. And not only to do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. See, we're all born in Adam. We're all sinners. We sin in thought, word, and deed. And, and there's a price to be paid for sin. Romans 6.23 is clear. The wages of sin is death. And so what that ultimately means is death means separation. As we deserve to be separated from God for all eternity in an unthinkable place of judgment, referred to in the Bible as hell. And so sin must be judged like any good judge. You know, we have laws in our society that if you break those laws, a penalty must be paid. That is a justice system that we're all familiar with. God has his justice system. Sin has to be paid for. Man has to be held responsible for his sin. But the good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ came to take care of that sin problem. Because we have a sin problem that we cannot solve. And that's what the good news of the gospel is all about. We've all broken God's laws. In fact, the law has a purpose to show you you're not all that you think you are, that you have fallen short of what God demands. Galatians 3 says, Therefore the law, the Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments, if you will, was our tutor to drive us to Jesus Christ so we could be justified not through our own works, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And so after faith has come, we're no longer under that tutor. The law has done its job. See, the law is designed to show every individual that they are sinful. And once it's done that, it's not needed anymore. In fact, <clears throat> once you're saved, once you put your faith in Christ, you're to walk by means of the Spirit and allow the Word of God through the Spirit of God to direct and undertake for you. So the law is for those who remain unconvinced of their sin in need of a Savior. I like what... Worsby had to say, he said, law and gospel go together, for the law without the gospel is a diagnosis without a remedy. But the gospel without law is only the good news of salvation for people who don't believe they need it because they've never heard the bad news of judgment. And so, again, if you don't see your need of a Savior, Jesus Christ will mean absolutely nothing to you. And so we have a sin problem. The Spirit of God is in the world today showing, trying to show you as an individual as you showed me as an individual, that my sin is separating me from God. I'm worthy to pay a price for that sin because God is holy, God is eternal life, and yet God doesn't want you to pay the price of that sin. Now, mankind oftentimes comes up with his own ideas to solve his sin problem. He'll try religion, and you can try every religion in the, uh, under the sun, and none of those things uh, will take away your sin because religion is predicated on you faithfully observing things and doing things and jumping through certain hoops, whatever it might be, in order to take away your sin. You could go to every church in town. That will not help you. You could try all the good works you can think of. You could be baptized, confirmed, and all the rest of it. But none of those things remove sin, and sin has to be removed. And that's why God provided his own son as a sacrifice. John 1.29 says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He, and he alone, is able to do that because he was sinless. This was predicted in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 53, 5 and 6 tell us that he, Christ, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was noticed upon him, and it's through his wounds we're spiritually healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way, and yet the Lord in love laid upon him, the Lord Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. And so the issue in salvation is not you turning over a new leaf or trying good works or jumping through hoops or promising not to sin anymore. It's recognizing you're, hope, you're hopeless and helpless to save yourself and then collapse by faith in what Christ provided for you in love. This is why he came. He came to save you and me, and he's the only Savior, and he saves anybody, regardless of what they've done, on the one simple condition that they accept him as their Savior, that they trust his work, the fact that he won the victory over the cross and took your punishment upon himself and rose victorious from the grave. Since he has now eternal life, he lives forevermore, he gives that freely to any and all that are willing to just simply take it. That's the good news of the gospel. It's a wonderful thing. Only Christ can give man heaven, eternal life, and the forgiveness of sins. So the only thing that condemns you is rejecting Christ. Whoever believes in him, notice, is not condemned. But who is the one that's condemned? 
He stands condemned. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He's trusting something other than Christ to save him. And that's the biggest swing and the miss in the universe. But in order for Christ to be worthy as a man to do that, he had to be tested. And that's what's taking place as we read here in the Gospel of Luke and Mark in particular, that expl or Matthew, that explain what Christ went through. Christ as a man had to be tested in order to prove himself worthy to be Israel's Messiah and the Savior of the world. And so the testing that he took, that he uh, experienced in the desert was ordained by God right out of the gate to show that he was worthy. And this came right after the, the greatest news anyone can hear. In Luke chapter 3, verse 22 tells us, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now we read in the Gospel of Mark, right after that, immediately he was drugged out to the desert to be tempted by the devil. And so the primary purpose of this passage is to show unequivocally that Jesus is worthy to be our Messiah and our Savior, for he did not, could not, and would not sin. See, the purpose of the testing was to discover if Jesus as a man would triumph over sin and temptation. And so the greatest assault he could endure was thrown at him in, his, in the weakest possible condition that he was in. To show that he was in fact able, willing, and capable of rescuing sinners and saving them for all eternity. And we know that he was tested and he passed. I've also seen as well that there's a secondary purpose of this passage. It's for Christ to teach his children, those who are saved, truths to demonstrate how we can resist temptations to sin. This is the pathway to victory he shows us here. And we're going to see some of that this morning. So as you think of the temptation, chapter 4, verse 1 says, that Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and so the Spirit of God is now directing him. He came upon him. Christ, from this point forward, is filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit is directing his steps. He returned from the Jordan and was led by that Spirit into the wilderness. And being tempted for 40 days by the devil, and in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And then the devil began to tempt him. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command the stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, I like Matthew, it says that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The devil then taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all this will be yours. So we're going to see that second temptation today. When you think of these temptations, they're all surrounded by the claim that Christ was the Son of God. That's how the devil opened up his line of temptation. Verse 3, it says, If you are the Son of God, and let's assume that you are, well then why don't you start acting like it? It's the essence of what he's saying here. Satan is asking, him, asking Christ to give proof of his deity according to the revelation of, that God gave at his baptism. Satan wanted proof that Christ himself would claim throughout his ministry. But all these temptations were designed to get Christ to compromise who he was and use his position as God in a selfish way contrary to the will of the Father. And so if you think of a principle to remember here, it's another one that we can add to the mix, temptations entice us to compromise biblical principle for selfish ends. That's what a temptation does. Blow off God, do your own thing, man. It's really the essence of it. Compromise what you know to be true. Satan is hoping to persuade Jesus to demonstrate his power to verify that it is real, but in doing so, he's asking Christ to violate God's plan for him. And that is wrong. See, Satan wanted Jesus to do what Satan wants all of us to do. That's to disobey God. That's where he gets his kicks. That's where he gets his worship. Every time you disobey him, you worship the devil. Now, we saw last time there's basically three basic temptations and one overall tactic of Satan. The three basic temptations we're seeing are centered around the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, 
and the pride of life. This is the thread that runs through all the temptations and testings that you and I will receive. And we get this from 1 John 2, 15. We're told as believers not to love the world, and the world here is the world system or the things in the world. If anyone's loving the world, you're not loving the Father at the same time. For all that is in the world, notice it's all summed up in here. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and these things are not of God but the world system that Satan rules. And this world system is passing away and it's all its lust, but he who does the will of God abides forever. And so no matter what temptation you may be dealing with, it falls into one of those three categories. But what's the one tactic Christ uses through it all? It's an attack on the integrity of God. He's seeking to undermine all of what God's word says, in order for you to raise doubts in your mind about the trustworthiness of the Word of God and the integrity of the character of God. It's a hidden but repeated message that he is saying that God is not who you think he is. He's not who he claims to be. Do not trust him. And so the first one we looked at last week was the lust of the flesh. Satan sought to prompt our Lord to act independently of the Father and contrary to the leading of the Holy Spirit by saving his life by commanding stones to be made into bread. This was a temptation for him to use his power to gratify an obvious personal physical need. It's not like the need wasn't legitimate, but it was to do so in a selfish, self-seeking way outside of the will of God. He says, don't wait for God to deliver you. Take matters into your own hands. Fix this problem yourself. You cannot trust God to do it. And he waited till he couldn't have been any hungrier, 40 days. I mean, most of us can't make it 40 minutes if you're like me, and you're starting to think about food again. And this has gone on for 40 days. He's on the verge of starving to death. And so he wanted Jesus to use his own resources to provide for himself whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted it. He's saying, in essence, your physical needs are greater and more important than honoring your Heavenly Father. That is a perpetual ploy of his. And yet Jesus knew better. You know, as I noticed, noted last time, the Old Testament connection to this first temptation of Christ is very real. It's part of the background of this test. We know that the nation, when it came out of Egypt, was repeatedly tested by the Lord, and they repeatedly failed. And they came to the crossroads of Kadesh Barnea, where God says, you can walk in and take the promised land. Twelve spies went in, and when they came back, ten said, we can't do it. We're like grasshoppers. They'll wipe us out. Two said, no. Caleb and Josh says, let's go in. God has already promised us. Let's go. The majority won out. And so for 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness till that generation died off. And so this is parallels the test that Christ came to see. Moses here, talking to the nation before they go into the promised land, says, and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. Now, it's interesting. This is the parallel to Christ. Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit of God. They were led 40 years. Jesus was led for 40 days. What was the point of it? It was to humble and to test you. This is a nation. Christ was led to be humbled and to be tested, to know what was in their heart and to know what was in Christ's heart as a man, whether you would believe God or not. That's the test. So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger. But he provided for your needs. Isn't that interesting? God the Father is not going to let Christ die here. There's a mission left to be done. And so Christ says, I'm going to test. God says, I'm going to test you to the ultimate. Are you going to believe me or not? Or are you going to take a shortcut, as we'll see here? But there was a purpose to it. That you might know God gave you bread for free. There was a purpose. So you would not live by the bread alone. That's easy for God. But you live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. God led the nation 
to a situation they'd be hungry to see if they would trust him. He fed them miraculously. But again, the point was so that they would recognize that God is faithful and he's trustworthy and they would obey him because he's not going to change who he is. He's not going to change who he is. And so how did Christ respond to this? The same passage here. Verse 4. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Christ responded to the temptation by quoting scripture in its context. And I go visit the importance of this after we looked at the next temptation. The essence of Christ did is what we are to do. He trusted God who is perfect love and does all things well, even though your testing may be severe, God's grace is sufficient. He's already promised to never test you above what you're able. He always already promised to make a way of escape. And so the testing, regardless of severity, says, you, God is saying, you can trust me. And the devil was attempting, like he did with Eve, to get Christ to distrust God's love and provision for him. I'm sure he tried to convince Christ that God the Father abandoned him, that he was disinterested in Jesus' plight. And Satan, one of his tactics, he'll whisper in your ear, God really doesn't love you. If he loved you, you'd be in a different set of circumstances. You ever fall for that one? Jesus doesn't love you. What father, can you imagine Satan saying, what father would treat his son this way? I mean, remember, his ploys are amazing. They're very effective. I mean, he says, God provided, he, I can see him saying, God provided food for that rebellious nation, and he won't even provide food for you. You've been faithful, and you get Nothing. Boy, if God the Father really loved you, man, he would have fed you a long time ago. He's always trying to undermine the integrity of God. But Jesus said, in essence, at the appropriate time, God will supply my food because that's who he is. So the issue is not, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word. It's my responsibility to honor God through faithful obedience to his word because God cannot be anything other than who he is. It is written. We're going to get to that. Every word. See, when you're tested or you're tempted, submission to the word of God is essential to obedience to the will of God. Christ says, I'm locked in on the word of God. The word of God cannot be broken. It cannot fail. He recognized that his highest good was not to satisfy or gratify his desires selfishly, even though he had a legitimate need, but to obey his Father for his glory. Christ knew that God the Father would ultimately take care of him so he could rest in his Father's goodness despite the difficulty. You know, you can have peace in your heart regardless of your circumstances by resting in your Savior. And yet so many people will exchange that for some temporal satisfaction through disobedience that is stained with guilt and shame that will only harden your heart. You know, when you succumb to a temptation, and if I do it as well, it just dulls our heart to the word of God and to the character of God. You know, Christ showed that he did not have to take, nor would he take matters into his own hands and stop trusting his heavenly Father. Now, what would you do? Would you trust the Lord in a difficult situation like that? So Jesus saw through it. Jesus was drawing on the whole context of the passage to show that God puts you in a place of deprivation for some spiritual purpose. You don't try to change it solely for making your life easier. And we're all tempted to do it. But I have needs. I don't know. I've been ministering to people, young people for over 35 years, and I don't know how many have said, well, God understands I have needs. Yes, he does understand you have needs, but do you understand who your God is? That's the question. Are you willing to wait for him? 
deepest satisfaction of life does not come from satisfying physical desires. It's a trap. It comes from actually worshiping God. That's where true satisfaction lies. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is good all the time? You know, a lot of times people, you know, they've been praying for a job and they get one and they say, well, God is good. Or you go to the doctor and you get a clean bill of health and God is good. You know, God is good all the time and all the time God is good. Regardless of your circumstances. If you're only going to say God is good when things go right for you, what does that mean he's not good when things don't? Does that make any sense at all? What did the psalmist say? You are good and do good, end of story. So he says, in humility, I want you to teach me all about yourself so I understand you more. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. He says, his prayer was to teach me Statutes, God says, good. Since I'm good, I'm going to afflict you. And so when you're thinking straight, you're going to say, well, Lord, thanks for the trial, man. I wouldn't have learned anything about you apart from the trial. Is God still good? Is that how you're thinking? Or is God all of a sudden bad because the Powerball numbers didn't come in? The only motive for making... Stones into bread would have been to distrust regarding the goodness and guidance of God. It would have been unbelief. It would have been distrust in the Father's care of his goodness, of his divine provision. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God reveals who God is. And honoring God is to be your goal, is to be the thread that runs through all that you do. The bread is inconsequential. Your times are in the Lord's hands. You know, Christ was not serving his heavenly father so he could get some bread. He was serving God because God is worthy. This is why I mentioned last week at the end as I tried to cram everything in, why did Paul say these words? Was because Paul was in great circumstances? He says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope and nothing I'll be shamed. He's in prison here. He's saying, God, if you get me out of the clink, well, then I'll serve you. No. It didn't matter if he was in the clink or not in the clink. It didn't matter if he, you read Philippians 4, he says, I know how to be hungry. I know how to have food. I don't care where I'm at. I don't care. I've been in every circumstances. It doesn't matter. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My goal is this. I want Christ to be magnified in my body. I don't really care if I live or die, thank you very much. Because for me to live is Christ. It should be a V there. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. Do you think like that? He had one objective. It wasn't, God, how can you make my life easier? God, how can I fulfill my wildest dreams with your help? He's saying this in the clink. He knew his times were in the Lord's hands. He knew God was good. He knew God had a good and acceptable and perfect will for his life. So instead of seeking God for what he could get out of him, Paul thanked God for his presence and his care. And he says, you know what? My one objective is just to see you honored. That's how Jesus Christ thought. That was it. You know, Job says, though he slay me, I'm going to trust in him. Job 13, 15. That's understanding who your God is. In fact, when he had the worst trial that all of us could probably ever experience, he lost everything he had and all those children. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I'm going to depart. The Lord is given. The Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That is it right there. Do you realize that according to Acts that you only live and move and have your being because God has given it to you? He gives you your very breath. So what right do you or I have to shake my fist at God and say, well, I want more than this, thank you very much. What exactly do you think you're entitled to? This is where Satan is always trying to paint the wrong picture of God. And this is why you need faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. 
And you know what that means? You must believe that he is, and that means he is who he is, and not someone he is not. And he's a rewarder that diligently seek the stuff that he can give me. No. You're seeking him? If you're seeking God for the stuff he can give you, well, you've got a pretty shallow relationship with the Lord, and it isn't going to last very long. In fact, the mindset should be, since I'm seeking him, and if his love for me allows difficulty to come and heartache to come, I will know that he only has my best in mind because he does all things well, so I'm going to seek him all the more. Because I believe he is who he is. In fact, how much do I know he loves me? Because when I was a filthy sinner running from him as far as I could, God demonstrates his own love for us. And while we were still sinners, it's not God didn't decide to love you because you cleaned yourself up a, a notch or two. He loved you because he's loved. He knows you. He knows every rotten thing about you and loves you anyway. That's so wonderful, isn't it? And so he proved it by what? Dying for you and taking the full brunt of all your rebellion and filth and all the rest of it upon himself. He hasn't changed. In fact, if you're his child here this morning, he loves you even more. He cannot abandon you. He can never allow you to be tested above what you're able. All these things are true. It's easy to fall into the trap to serve God to get something. That angle will be perpetually thrown at you by Satan. And so many think, well, if God doesn't give me what I want, I'm going to try something else because it's all about me and God. You're not coming through for me, so thank you very much. We'll see you. A couple Wednesday nights ago, we sang a song. It's one of my favorite children of the Heavenly Father, and one of the stanzas says, oh, how does it go now? What, what he takes or what he gives us shows the Father's love so precious. That's ministered to me countless times. You know, a poem that ministered to me so many years ago and I put in that booklet I wrote, it's called He Maketh No Mistake. This was written by a guy named A.M. Overton who lost his wife and baby at a childbirth. They both died. And at the funeral, he said this, My father's way may twist and turn, my heart may throb and ache, but in my soul I'm glad to know he maketh no mistake. My cherished plans may go astray, my hopes may fade away, but still I'll trust my Lord to lead, for he doth know the way. Though night be dark and it may seem the day will never break, I pin my faith, my all in him, for he maketh no mistake. There's so much now I cannot see, my eyesight's far too dim. But come what may, I'll simply trust and leave it all to him. For by and by the mist will lift and plain it all he'll make. Through all the way, though dark to me, he made not one mistake. Do you believe that? How many mistakes has God made recently? None. This is severe testing Christ is doing. And you might have to go through some testing. Obviously, you'd rather not. But God is in perfect control of all of it with purposes that oftentimes are way beyond you. He maketh no mistake. What's the second temptation? Verse 5, Then the devil, taking him upon a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give to you in their glory... For this has been delivered to me, and I'll, I can give it to whoever I want. So if you will worship me, it'll all be yours. This was an appeal to the lusts of the flesh. Or excuse me, the lust of the eyes. He's showing all the glory, all the bright lights, all the magnificence. The kingdoms of the world all at once. Now, the question we could really ask is, were these kingdoms his to offer to Christ? It says right here, it says, it's been, this authority has been handed over to me. Well, when did that happen? Well, it appears that this happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam sinned. Originally, the earth was subjected to man. The earth was designed by God to supplant 
supply all of man's needs. He didn't have to do anything other than tend the garden. They could accept the glory of that earth and just allow it to provide for them, and they can enjoy it. But when Adam see, sinned, he, there was a change in the chain of command. He handed it over to Satan. And now the world became subject to him. Christ often referred, referred to Satan this way. In John 14, 30, it says, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world. That is in reference to Satan. The ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. So Satan, this is his domain. In John 12, 31, he said, now, the judgment, now, this, now is the judgment of this world, and the ruler of this world will be cast out. He said, and Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, who the, whose minds the God of this age, small g, has blinded. Satan is in the blinding business. They don't believe lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine into them. So when Adam listened to his wife and believed the lie of Satan, he gave up his power, his dominion to him. He forfeited the earth to Satan, and this is why 1 John 5.13 says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Again, in reference to Satan. This is his domain. But here's the lie. It's really not his to give away. In Daniel 4, 32, Daniel is speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, You'll be driven from human society. You will live in the fields of wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world, and he gives them to anyone he chooses. God gives these things away. And, you know, Satan knew, and, God, and Jesus knew that that God had promised him the kingdom of the world. So if you read Psalm 2, it's a messianic psalm. It says, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Christ knew that he was going to be handed these kingdoms through that promise. He knew that. When Daniel was given this vision in Daniel chapter 7, it says, In a vision of the night I looked, and before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into the presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Christ knew this about himself. Satan knew that Christ knew. But you see, Satan is a liar. There's no truth in him. Isn't that interesting? This is what Christ said about Satan. You have your father, the devil. What a lovely thing to say to the Pharisees. And the lusts of your father, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth because, notice, there is zero truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. And a half-truth is a whole lie. And if Jesus were to bow to Satan, the title deed of the earth truly would have been passed on to him. So there's a half-truth here. So what Satan is really offering to Jesus is rulership over the earth. He's offering Jesus an easy road to become the political, military, ruling sort of Messiah that the Jews were expecting in that day. But it came at a price. See, in the second temptation, the issue is not to trust God's love and care, but to trust God's plan and therefore not wait upon him. To not wait upon him. All the kings of the world, the lust of the eyes. You know, Satan could approach this from many angles. Can you see him come along and say, you know, Jesus... This is a great opportunity for you to make a profound difference for good. You could skip the cross and go directly to the throne. You could stop all the injustice and eliminate all the poverty and all the pain and suffering. It would be a wonderfully unselfish thing for you to do. Can you see that angle? 
See, what Satan is always throwing before us is what we can call the lure of instant results. Who wants instant results? We all do. We're all vulnerable to this. In fact, we're really good at justifying a good reason why we should take a shortcut, right? It's the temptation to compromise what you know to be true for the sake of expediency. I'm sure, again, Christ is very weak here. He's gone 40 days without food. Why don't you avoid the struggle you're about to undergo on earth? Avoid the agony of the cross. Obtain the kingdom you're entitled to without the suffering. You've already been struggling 40 days and 40 nights. Let's call it a truce. Let me spare you the sorrow and pain. Let's just get her over with. And yet, this was all part of God's plan. So he's saying, why don't you take a shortcut? Get what you got coming to you. Avoid the process. Skip the heartache. Avoid the difficulty. Why wait? We're all tempted like that. Every time you're tempted to cheat on a test, to pad your resume, I mean, whatever it takes to avoid a difficulty so you can come on ahead, that's the essence of this particular temptation. Do it without suffering. Do it now. You can have it all. It's one little hitch, though. You've got to fall down and worship me. Oh. And what did Christ do? He responded again by quoting Scripture in context. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, verse 8, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, again, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. You think I'm going to I'm going to violate the scripture by worshiping you? Jesus is essence is saying there's only one right way. God is God, right is right. I'm not going to compromise with evil. I'm not going to give allegiance to Satan. It's always a guaranteed path to worse sin and eventual eternal destruction for the unbeliever. His tactics, the devil's tactics, again, haven't changed in 2,000 years. He's always telling you to compromise what you know to be true because you're the exception to the rule. You will get away with it. That guy, nah, not so much, but you, you're special. You'll get away with it. And how many believers compromise the truth of Scripture and the character of God for what they picture as an easier life? You know, I really just want an easy life, so I'm going to just going to skip this principle here and this principle here, and live life on my terms, and, and that'll be just fine. Because Satan promises an easy life, and he never tells you about the pain. He's an outstanding salesman, convinces you there's little price to pay at all. He shows you the real pleasures in sin, which, again, only lasts for a season, but he never shows you the pain, like with Eve. Hey, you can be like God knowing good and evil. Really? Yeah, but it'll ruin you for life. Never mentioned that, did it? Come on, Jesus, don't go through it, man. You can have the whole thing right now. You've got a long road ahead of you, a road of suffering, pain, ridicule, scorn, hunger, thirst, no place to lay your head. This is a fast track to accomplish God's will. Easy shortcut around the cross. You know, God's promised to give it to you, but he's taken way too long. It requires too much sacrifice. Just worship me and I'll give it to you now. Sounds good, doesn't it? He likes the line of instant gratification. You know, Burger King, have it your way, right? Have it your way, but Satan throws in there right away. Not only can you have it your way, but you can have it your way right away. Have you ever thought what your price for doing wrong is? It's probably not real high if you're like me. What would you compromise to get ahead? To dishonor your Savior who gave his all for you. People sell out Jesus Christ for money, for the lust of the flesh. Doesn't matter. And you're worshiping him in the process. Satan fails to mention that you'd be serving Satan the rest of your days. 
And so Jesus understood what he was up against and didn't budge. He didn't budge. In fact, I wonder if that wasn't behind what he said right here. What good is it a man for gain the whole world and that forfeit his soul? Waste your life. You know, it's interesting, worship here, and in this context is the Greek word that means to bend the knee, to bow the knee. Satan was asked Jesus to bow the knee. Bowing the knee is an act of reverence, respect, and submission to the person in whom <clears throat> in whose presence you drop to your knees. You know, Satan knew that there's a day coming for him that he was not all looking forward to. He knew that someday he'd bow the knee and he's trying to convince Jesus to sell out because Satan knew this principle. Therefore, in reference to Christ, God, since Christ humbled himself the most, he's going to be exalted the highest. Philippians 2.9 says, Therefore God has highly exalted Christ and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, Satan. And every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. That's coming. Satan knew that. Even Christ knew that because he said this in Isaiah 45. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness. It shall not return that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. He shall say, surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength to him Men shall come, and all shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. And the Lord, all the descendants of Israel, shall be justified and shall glory. Satan knew this scripture. Jesus knew this scripture. Satan knew one of the reasons Jesus came to earth, to get the dominion back. And Satan says, I don't want to give up control. You can have it all. Just, just don't suffer, man. Just don't suffer. And again, Satan doesn't have this authority. He thinks he does. We just read, God gives the kingdoms of the world to whoever he wants to rule over them. Satan can't give it to anybody, but he does rule this system of evil. And his power is ordained by God. Satan is a liar. I like what Luther said years ago. He said, the devil is God's devil. Because Satan can't move an inch outside of God's direct permission and purpose. But he was saying to Christ here, I'll make life easy for you. You deserve it. You're the son of God. You're supposed to have the kings of the world for your own. You're supposed to be a ruler. You can have it all right now. I'll gladly give it to you. You know, as I thought about that, you know who bought into this lie and paid a a price higher than he ever dreamed was Lot. See, Lot was taken in by the lust of the eyes. You know, when him and Abraham came out of Egypt, they were rich, and they had to go their separate ways. And Abraham says, listen, man, I know God will take care of me. You go wherever way you want, and I'll just go the other way because I know God will take care of me. So Lot, what did he do? He looked up, and he saw the whole plain of Jordan was well watered. It's as lush as it gets. It's Augusta National in April, right there. Like the Garden of the Lord. This is beyond beauty. But this is before the Lord turned it into a salt heap. So Lot, notice, chose for who? He didn't consult the Lord. He says, hey, 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 hey. I got money signs for eyeballs. I get this plain here. I got her made in the shade. So what did he do? He set out toward the east. That's the direction he went. What was driving him was the lust of the eyes. See, in his mind, earthly possessions and status were of greater priority than honoring the Lord. And this is where the problem begins. You start eyeballing something that looks nice and that leads to compromising God's values for whatever earthly gain is promised. He might have thought, you know, what's the big deal? I won't have anything to do with these people. I know they're wicked. I'll just go about my business. They won't impact me. I know better. I can handle it. No, you can't. And if you think like that, you're a fool. Why are you special? 
spiritual compromise tends to begin by mentally forfeiting a spiritual value for an earthly one and thinking that you'll weather the storm and it'll be okay because you can beat it. Well, did things get better or things get worse? Well, when God came to judge the place, we know this story in Genesis 19, the men of Sodom, both young and old, and all the people to the last man surrounded the house, and they called aloud, where are those men who came to you? Bring them out that we may know them. And that went out to the men to the entrance and shut the door behind him and says, I beg you, my brothers, don't act so wickedly. But I'll act wickedly. You can have my daughters. You know, he wasn't affected at all by the culture of Sodom, was he? It's hard for me even to read that. He readily offers his two virgin daughters to be raped. His moral compass is as whacked as it gets because he made a decision to compromise what he knew to be true, and you only go downhill when you do that. It's amazing. You know, once sin enters the heart and makes us lose sight of God's moral standard, we start measuring things based on the corrupt relative standard around us. And all of a sudden, things that were unthinkable become acceptable. It's amazing. Whoops. You know, when you give your passions, give into your passions, ultimately they take you over. I mean, no one wants to say, you know, I think I'll become an alcoholic when I grow up. And they take their first beer saying, yep, I'm well on my way. Or a drug addict or whatever it is you're addicted to. When you do the flesh, it controls you. You know, it's interesting. Everything Lot lived for, he lost. Everything. And Satan will tell you, yeah, that happened a lot, but you know what? It won't happen to you because you're special. I mean, he lost his testimony when, when the angels warned him, hey, you know what? We're going to destroy this place. He goes talk to his, his sons-in-laws, and they laughed at him. God? God who? Then he lost his wife and his two daughters who survived the judgment. He went them. They commit incest with him and, and start two nations that were enemies, Israel's. He wasn't affected by the culture at all. They weren't affected by the culture at all. See, Satan is a liar, and even though he promises Christ this, do you think he would have kept his promise? No. But again, how did Christ win the victory? You need to, first of all, you need to recognize the authority of Scripture. The authority of Scripture. He said, it is written. End of story. It is written. And you know what? All Scripture is God-breathed. That means this is authority right there. It's authority right there. And it's to be your personal authority without question. But Satan's goal is to undermine it so you don't think, well, you know what, I don't really agree with that part of the Bible, and so, you know, I'm just going to blow it off. That happens all the time. I don't like what God's Word said about child training. I don't like what God's Word says about this. I don't like... So I've got my own ideas, thank you very much. And you know what? Believers do that, and it blows up in their face, and they think, well, wait, how on earth did that ever happen? Well, you didn't take God seriously. You thought you had a better idea than God. See, to win victory over Scripture, not only do you need to know the Scriptures, you need to believe it and apply it. Do you know the Scriptures so that you can believe and apply them? Parents, do you work with your children to even work on the memory work for Sunday school so you're planning the Word of God in their heart? Because you always make time for what you think has value. Are you working with them saying, this is how this thing works in our life. This is why these verses are important. This is what God wants us to understand so we can honor him and look at life the way he wants us to see it. You know, the, the children of the future of the church, are you imparting to them a respect for God and his word so that when we're all dead, at least me in 20 years, that whoever's left to pick it up, has been taught to think biblically and principally and has, wants to honor the Lord? Are you teaching them reverence for the Lord? Are you teaching them, even when we do a song special, that 
this is a privilege and we should do it well? Do you even know the songs they're singing for the Mother's Day special? Does that mean anything to you? See, Satan will always tell you, it really isn't that big of a deal. Let her go. Just let her go. Christ didn't have a chance apart from the Word of God. This is useful. Our version says profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness so that we can be equipped to do the things God wants us to do by the grace of God. That's what it's all about. Every scripture serves to meet the moral and spiritual needs of mankind. They are sufficient. Do you believe that? Jesus fired back. He didn't fire back with this nice, I got, this, I got a different take, Satan. I got this philosophy going for me here, man. No, he said, it is written, end of story. This is the principle, and I'm not budging. He knew the scriptures, and you know, he knew them as a man. He learned the scriptures as a man. That's what's so amazing about it. And do you realize that you've been given the same opportunity? And in the context of spiritual attack, we've been given armor by God to stand against the wiles of the wicked one. And part of that armor, this is the offensive part, is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And the word word here is not logos, which is a typical word for word of God. It's the Greek word rhema. And it means the specific sayings of God. In other words, specific scriptures that are designed to be used at the appropriate time to deliver your soul from a difficult situation. Jesus quotes specific stricture, scriptures that were appropriate for the test or temptation that he was given. Jesus wasn't the exception to the rule. He learned the scriptures the way you and I are, and he depended upon them like you and I are to do. He's doing this as a man. Are you willing to wait on the Lord in your trial, or are you going to take a shortcut like Satan's always offering you? You know, like, without faith, it's impossible, please him. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you know what? He's into waiting. Therefore, the Lord will wait that he might be gracious to you. The reason you don't get everything you want when you think you want, when you think needed, is because God's being gracious to you, and he says, I've got a plan here, will you trust me? No, I won't. And says, God says, I'm going to be gracious to you so I can be exalted and I can have mercy upon you. Do you realize that God wants to be merciful with you? Then why doesn't he fix my situation now? Because now is not the time. Do you believe that? Blessed are all those that wait for him. Are you going to be one of the blessed? Are you going to wait upon him? Are you going to take him at his word? Are you going to purpose in your heart that, you know what? It's all about God. It's not about me. And it's my privilege to honor him by walking by faith. And that's what I'm going to do. You can tell what's in my brain because every time I go over this verse, since I was a Tom Petty guy in the 70s and 80s before I was saved, I always think the waiting is the hardest part. It was one of his songs. It comes right back into my brain. And the waiting is the hardest part, isn't it? But God is faithful. He's faithful. The scripture cannot be broken. And so, are you willing to wait? Are you willing to honor? Have you purposed in your heart that you're going to honor the Lord Jesus Christ out of the thankfulness that he has bore all this for you and loves you supremely and can't do anything that is inconsistent with who he is in your life or mine? Boy, it's a challenge, isn't it? He knows everything and in every way you were tested, and he passed it. And he's there to help you. And he's saying, pay attention, children. The word of God is designed to deliver your soul. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. We're going to hear a devotion later this month. The word preached didn't help the Exodus generation because they didn't mix it with faith when they heard it. And you could be no different, and I can be no different. The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than two-edged sword. It's able to deliver your soul from death. 
Christ was the trailblazer. He showed us the way. And Hebrews 2.18 says he lives now to help you in your situation. It's amazing. We've got so many reasons to be thankful. We're out of time. Let's give thanks. Father, we're grateful. As we consider what our Savior went through for the likes of us and what he had to face. And he knows everything that we face and loves us supremely and is there to deliver our souls. We thank you that we have the word of God here this morning. I, I pray that we would not take it for granted. We take it to heart and allow it to minister to us for your glory. So we thank you for these truths and principles. I pray the Spirit of God would encourage our hearts to the end that we would worship the Lord our God, who is so worthy. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.